Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Can everybody hear us on my mic? Can you can you hear me? Can you hear me with this mic or? So where to begin? I just want to say, Brad, how much I loved your book, and I encourage everyone who's here to immediately go out and get a copy. You can read this book in one sitting because it's that good and it's that compelling. Um, and I just want to begin um, by talking a little bit about the book. You know, it's the story of three very different people who seek refuge, sanctuary in a monastery that's in a remote part of Vermont. It's also about the convergence of lives, folks who are escaping circumstances. One is um, escaping a war in their homeland. Another is escaping a war that's within. And the third person is really grappling with um, a war between their mind and their body. And I was wondering if you could just give the audience a brief summary of the book and talk about why you chose these particular characters. Sure. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Lynn, for coming. Um, well, the book had, has its genesis in, in kind of the place where I live, which is you know, I moved from New York City uh, to rural Vermont about two decades ago. And it turns out that we live next door to a monastery and we hear their Vesper bells in the evening. And so I was always interested in, in I mean, previous to moving there, I had always been interested in monastic life and you know what it would be like. I love Thomas Merton and I loved his, his writing and his example. And um, so it was kind of uncanny that we ended up there and we, you know, next to this monastery and then down the road is yet another monastery, a Russian Orthodox. Monastery, the monks of Nuskeet, who people may know, they, they train dogs. They're um, the, the dog training monks. Um, and then, I mean, I could go on. There's another one over yet another hill in Weston, in Vermont, and another uh, uh, n n place where the nuns live. So there was this idea that people had come to this North Country area to, um, to find sanctuary, to find uh, like a rural retreat. And uh, so I wanted to set a book there in that, in that sort of timeless um, space uh, that happens in, in monastic life. Um, and at the same time, it was 2010 or so when I started this book. And um, this idea of sanctuary, this idea of um, basically closing in, you know, an enclosure and, and closing in the world and, 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 you know, led to the idea that who are you excluding? Who are you leaving out? And it was a time when the refugee crisis, you know, was unignorable. And uh, my wife, Donna Ann McAdams, a photographer, was working with Joanna Hola, who works for Physicians for Human Rights. And they were doing this project, this photography documentary project on, um, with asylum seekers. Uh, mostly LGBTQ asylum seekers, and Donna was doing the portraits. Joanne was writing and working with them. So, um, so I had heard these really compelling and awful stories about people who were whose asylum had been denied, and they were going to retrial again, you know, in the states to try it for the last time. Um, so it was that confluence of, you know, the, 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 sang, the, the monk, and that's when Saro kind of appeared in my imagination, uh, or, or, you know, that's where that came for, for, the, for the folks who don't know, Saro is a, is a young Somali woman who makes an epic journey from Mogadishu um, through South America up to um, Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's kind. It is an it's an epic and incredible journey, and she's welcomed into the monastery by Father Christopher, who's also on his own spiritual journey. Is it not working? Who's also on his own spiritual um, journey, and she's rescued by Edward. Edward, uh, uh, no, Teddy, oh, Teddy, Teddy Fletcher, yeah, Teddy, Ed, Ted, Ted, yeah, Edward's Ted. the other guy. The, yeah. <laughs> by Teddy, <laughs> um, by Teddy Fletcher, Ted who. Ed is a Vietnam, not a Vietnam, uh, vet, uh, an Afghanistan veteran who has also found refuge in the monastery as the, as the groundskeeper. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really curious because you talk about the Somali community in Vermont is why Vermont? Yeah, why did they settle? Yeah, there? why settle there? Um, because, you know, we think of the Somali community settling in Minneapolis and other parts of the country, but I'd never heard 
about a settlement yeah. in Vermont. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, um, a lot of people don't know that that it's it's um, and a lot of so in the early in the mid nineties they there there was a movement this this organization that I ended up working with the U.S. Committee of Refugees and Immigrants their Vermont USCRI's Vermont office has been you know, welcoming immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers since the 80s. And, and so Somali started arriving there in the, I think, uh, the late 90s, or actually, no, in the early 2000s. And um, so it's one of the smaller Somali communities in the country. I mean, we know about Maine, we know Minneapolis and Atlanta and San Diego. Um, and in fact, through this group, I ended up um, working alongside uh, a mother and and son uh, who helped me, you know, who kind of helped me get Saro right after getting her wrong so many times. <laughs> um, that happened sort of many years into the novel when I got more deeply involved with the Somali community in Burlington. Um, and it's not their story, but it was just being around them and hearing them talk and getting involved in their life somewhat, you know, in a very limited fashion that I felt a certain comfort. So what was revealed to me in part of those conversations was this woman Fardosa's journey, which is completely not like this. I mean, she was in Yemen. Uh, she has children with disability. She came through, through Romania to Vermont. And so, um, this is a long way of saying when they found out in Romania that they were that they were being sent to Burlington, Vermont, and they quickly went to the computer and looked up, you know, they were expecting high rises and cities, they saw cows, and they were really upset. <laughs> they're like, why do we I mean, they like everything goes wrong for them and they're being sent to this Vermont. And, you know, it was up into the point where they're flying into Burlington at night, and they're waiting to see, you know, towers and buildings, even like despite what they've seen online, they think it's gotta be a city and it's just dark. So, um, so yeah, I mean, despite that, there, there, they've, there is this small community that's found kind of a home there. So. And, and so your character, Saro, at the beginning of the novel, she's escaping from ICE mm. who um, are on her trail and she, it, it, um, in the middle of the night, she makes this journey up to Vermont with um, someone who we only meet for a very brief time. And mm -hmm. uh, they get into a car accident. Um, um, I guess it was a moose that was yeah. in, it was, it was in, the, in the road and they're rescued by Teddy, the groundskeeper and taken to a monastery that's a very, very close community and doesn't really welcome anyone in. But Christopher, who's the, the abbot, is really forced to make a very difficult decision and give her shelter, knowing that he may be putting the monastery and the other brothers in danger. And so I, I just want to pivot for a moment and ask you um, about monastic life, because it's so beautifully illustrated in, in the novel, you know, the rituals of the priests. And for so many of us, it's such a mystery. I mean, it's far and it's remote and we never get a chance to go inside of these monasteries. And it's one of the things that I really loved about um, the book was going into this world, which is so close yet so foreign to me. And what was the research that you did there? Yeah. Um, so I, I spent, you know, weeks in at different monasteries. I did retreats. Um, I went to St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Mass. It's a Trappist monastery. Um, I spent time at our, our local, not the one on the mountain, because they're Carthusians and they don't take anyone. <laughs> and you're not allowed in. And they are, um, you know, they have the vows of silence. And uh, I've walked up there because literally it's in the, it's in the backyard. It's about two thousand feet climb up the mountain. And I've snooped around their monastery <laughs> and run into monks, and, and they actually do <laughs> but they talk. Can, oh, they I mean, do talk. They do talk. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, they talk when they're not in the. They'll. They actually. We see them walking along the road, and they're just laughing it up. <laughs> <laughs> they're having a good old time, you know. It's like because it's like the Spetsieren, I think it's called. You know, there's where they have like their their yearly long walk. It's called like the long walk or the long hike. Um, where they're let free of the asylum, you know, like, 
and they write about, I mean, I've read, read about it and it's like their holiday. Anyhow, so I spent time in monasteries and I met, you know, I met and became friends with monks and um, learned about the, their life. I mean, it's, it's kind of a beautiful life um, in a way. So it was just spending time. And when you were in the monasteries, did you actually um, walk through the rituals that the monks um, move through in their daily life or were you just observing? Yeah, so yes, yes and no. I mean, I'm, I'm, so the first part of, I think the first part of this research was getting used to being in the skin of a, of a Christian, you know, of a Catholic because I'm Jewish. I mean, I was raised a Jew. And, um, and so it took a long time to be able to inhabit Christopher, understand him fully. Um, and, and it was only through, through time and different experience and secretly taking communion somewhere, <laughs> namely the Vatican, um, <laughs> that I understood, I understood. Because one of the things about the Catholic Church, which I don't understand is, is um, that non-believers can't take communion, that if you're not baptized, right, you can't okay. take communion. And so um, it was almost by mistake that I ended up taking communion because it was, we were in Rome for the year and we were at a, a ceremony, we were at a, a mass and, uh, and I had fallen asleep, it was an Italian and woke up. You found up. the wafer on your tongue? It was just woke up and I just <laughs> felt, I just felt drawn. <laughs> and you know, Jana is, my wife's Catholic. So for her, it was like, yeah, I'm gonna go take, and I just followed her. And it was actually the first night of Hanukkah too. So. <laughs> and there was a full moon. So, um, so it felt like everything was aligning. And I just got up there and I was, somebody put bread in my mouth. And it was like the most, and I broke down crying. Oh, it was wow. like the most amazing, like I didn't understand because it was like, you had to take it in bodily to understand, oh, somebody's feeding me. And, and it's the Godhead, you know, it's like you're eating, it's like the most ancient kind of primal when you, you know, for indigenous people killing an animal and eating it and you're taking, you know, that, that cycle of life. So it made sense to me. So uh, I was able to go, you know, kind of understand it. Well, you know, you, you talk about food. One of the really lovely things in the book is how um, Father Christopher very intentionally goes about making Somali food for um, Sharu. 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 Thank you. Yeah. For, 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 for Saru, yeah. Saru. And I can tell you, it's, I've attempted to make injera seven times, and it's very, very difficult. And I was kind of astonished in the book that he got it right on the first try. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the joy of, that's the joy of fiction. Because, <laughs> because I was like, wow, good for him. Yeah. Well, that, that she actually recognized it as, <laughs> as um, I mean, injera is like the it's Ethiopian, very, yeah, the Ethiopian and Kanjira version, yeah. is Somali yeah. or Lahu. And so, um, yeah, I tried making it. I didn't it's really. Very, it's very complicated to yeah. make. I mean, it's a, it's a multi-step process and it's trial and error. Fermentation. Fermentation. Yeah. <laughs> we should say that, that, were you making it for your son? I was making it for my son who's, who's, who's Ethiopian. Yeah. Um, and we, as I said, we tried seven times. Did you not take and, it? We and, well, no, I mean, we, we ate it. It just never tasted authentic. Yeah. You know, we had one batch that actually tasted okay. Was it Tef? I mean, it's it was, like Tef yeah, it was flour. flour. I mean, we did, we did everything that you're supposed to do. Yeah. You know, we followed the instructions. We, you know, it sat overnight, it fermented. Mm -hmm. We put it in, in the pan and it yeah. just didn't bubble up and do what it was yeah. supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So he does, he does end up, I mean, he, he thinks about what he can do to make this woman feel more comfortable uh, because she's just, you know, she's fleeing to Canada. She's got hypothermia. She's recovering in the monastery and he's, what can I do? So he starts to look up Somali recipes and he, um, and then he makes it with maple syrup because to add to Vermont, yeah. you know, <laughs> and she, she eats it. I don't know if she's really convinced, but. Well, she, I, I believed her. Yeah. You know, you, you think about journeying to a foreign country. I remember many, many years ago when I was young, um, 
uh, and I was traveling, I was backpacking around Europe and I ended up in Greece with, with no money and, and, and not able to speak the language at all. And I had called my parents and this is true. And I said, I'm stuck in Greece, I have no money. And they said, you'll figure it out. <laughs> 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 which which I, I I did and um, it was it was very difficult and I ended up in Paris at, at, you know struggling to get money just to get to the the airport and I remember like begging on um, the street and then begging in the Garde du Nord and finally this American gave me some m money um, and he put me on the train he said this train is going to take you to the airport. And the train took me two hours in the opposite direction. <laughs> and when I got off the train, and there's a reason I'm telling this story. When I got off the train, I was in the middle of this small town. It must have been around midnight, and, the, and it was desolate. And there was no one there. And I remember going to a phone booth and trying to dial a number. And finally, I dialed the police. And they spoke French. And I tried to say help. And you know, no one came. And I remember just crumbling and crying and this man, this um, African man from Eritrea actually found me and he said, come with me. And I was like, my first impulse was like, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not gonna go with you. And I was frightened. And there's something about the way in which he invited me to come with him and the kindness in his face that said, this is okay. And so I went back to his apartment and he made me dinner because I hadn't eaten in a while. And then he gave me, he had a tiny, tiny bed and he's like, you sleep in the bed, I'll sleep on the floor. And then the next morning I woke up, he made me breakfast and he took me to the airport. And I tell that story because I was thinking so much of the journey that um, Saro takes from Somalia and how difficult it is for a woman mm -hmm. and for a black woman to, to um, navigate traveling in a world that really is not welcoming and is very hostile. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that journey, because there's so many acts of kindness and people that she encounters, even though she has an enormous agency. She's someone who at 19 or 18 decides that she is going to take this epic journey, not just for herself, but for her, her family. And it's a complete leap of faith. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you can talk just a little bit about that that journey. Sure, although and I'd like- the acts of kindness Yeah, 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 just... although we all want to hear about more about your story. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because you were sorrow. I was sorrow, you know, yeah. it's, it's, and it's interesting. And I, have, I won't go into details, but I know how difficult it is to be sort of a solo traveler as a black woman. Yeah. And, you know, when I was in Europe, you know, en encountering the equivalent of ICE, being round up, being taken off of trains, yeah, 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 and yeah. you know, sitting, um, you know, sitting by the railroad for hours while that train goes by, and you're not permitted to 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 right. move. Yeah. Um, so your memoir. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Acts of kindness. Well, you don't have to talk about acts of kindness. I'm curious because okay. there's so many routes that people take to come to this country yeah. and why you decided that she was going to take this very difficult route through South America. Yeah, well, because it was happening, because this was 2000. I mean, when Saro entered the picture, it was maybe 2012 or 13 when I was writing. And I had read these stories about this, these two Somali men who were found in the Darien Gap, you know, found right. in the jungle. Uh, it was, it was actually written. Folks where that is, it's in yeah, the so um, the Panama, so the journey that people were taking from the Horn of Africa and from different places, um, you, know, e you know, even Haiti back then, would be to go fly to Ecuador or Peru or Colombia um, or Brazil, and then slowly make your way up through South, South America, into Panama through the through the, this dangerous little strip of land called the Darien Gap, which is jungle, with unpassable. I mean, the Pan American Highway ends there, and it's run. You know, narc, it's chaos, it's anarchy. I mean, narco traffickers and local gangs and the, the the police. They're the ones who are in control there. So to pass through it, it takes I think four or five days on foot, right. and people were making this this epic journey. And that and then once you got through that, if you got through that. 
you had to go through, you know, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, you know, you had to make your way up to Mexico and then you had to get through Mexico and then you had to get to the American, the, the Texas border. So it was this, I was astonished that people were coming from the other side of the world uh, and from Asia too, and making this journey, which was like, it was like, you know, Thor Heyerdahl, you know, it was like the equivalent of these explorers coming to this new world and, and risking everything. So, and nobody was really talking about it back then. Yeah. I mean, it, it only now recently people are sending me articles about, you know, the Haitians under the bridge and how they're coming up through Central America. And like, can you believe that they're making this journey? And like, well, yes, if, you know, people that were paying attention know that this was happening. And, you know, back in the Obama administration. You know, in, in your afterward in the book, you talk about the fact that you um, had intended to write a dystopian novel that was set in the near future but as you began to write it you know the future converged with the present and um particularly with what's happening with the haitians at the the border who, yeah. who have taken this epic journey i mean they you know they mostly probably didn't fly no. to south america they yeah. probably took boats, boats and ships yeah. and yeah. however they managed to get there and probably island hopped until they got to South America, but now they're stuck at the border. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, when I started the book, I mean, I always, it was, you know, 2010, I thought, well, this will, I'll set this action in the near future when the shit hits the fan, when the borders are closed, when some, you know, I mean, pandemic, the first thing was a pandemic that I thought about, and I thought, I scrapped that. It's, <laughs> it's too crazy. <laughs> You know, it's like, forget the pandemic. I had people leaving New York in caravans. Like, you know, I read the plague, the plague year. I did all this research on plagues and I just thought, no, it's not. So, but it was going to be in the future, you know, and then the future arrived, you know, very quickly and then surpassed the fiction, you know? So it was like through the Trump years into, into the very end of the Biden, the start of the Biden, you know, where the book, before the book came out. So, um, it's still going on though. I mean, nothing's changed. You, know, you were talking about putting on sort of metaphorically the, ro the, the monk's robes and being a Christian. And one of the things that I've done a lot as a writer is, is, is research other cultures and immerse myself. Um, I spent a lot of time in East Africa um, talking to refugees for a play that I wrote called Ruined um, and talking to people about trauma and trying to figure out how do you how do you write trauma without re-traumatizing people, mm -hmm. you know, and how do you inhabit the um, the body of, of others and people who are so far and from your yourself. And I remember when I was writing Ruin, Ruined, I felt very panicked mm -hmm. um, about telling the stories of Congolese women because their stories felt so specific to that re region and so far and from who I am. And when, um, when we were interviewing them, my husband, Tony, was there and he took all of these beautiful photographs. And it was back when you still took um, photographs and you had to get them processed. So you couldn't look at them immediately. And so after this journey in, in East Africa, we came home and I was looking through the photographs. And there was one a picture of all of the women who we interviewed who were wearing these beautiful, colorful boo-boos. And... I didn't realize for a moment that I was in the midst of them because I was also wearing a boo-boo. And once I saw that, I realized that I had a way into telling that story. Nice. I thought for the great, but for the grace of God, this is my own story. I am these women. And it really cracked it open and it made me much bolder um, about entering into this foreign space. And so I wonder for you, because you, you know, you write about a Vietnam vet write about a, a Christian monk and you write about a Somali woman and each of those people are, are I imagine very different from yeah. yourself and my, it, it required yeah. a certain level of immersion yeah I didn't have a boo-boo <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was different it was yeah I mean it was something that constantly you know why is the white middle-aged white guy writing about uh, you know, an African Muslim young woman. And, um, and it was, you talk about anxiety and panic yes. that you've experienced. Well, so I experienced that for years. 
for good reason. I mean, the questions are real and why, I mean, the questions of appropriation, to, you know, down to who are you to tell the story, you know, stay in your lane. Well, so there's a number of answers that I have to the question um, of why or how. Or how, I guess it's not so much why, because I think we understand why. You understand why, but how I think yeah. is that, so, Zadie Smith writes about, she wrote in Defense of Fiction, this essay that writes about, um, has, have novels been creators of compassion or have they been vehicles for containment? And she's using, you know, Whitman's I Contain Multitudes and a poem by Emily Dickinson um, about her, about grief, sharing grief with others. And what, what is there, she has the, the fascination to presume that her grief is like others. And that's what, you know, and it's, it's a presumption. So, um, so I struggled with this and, um, and um, one thing that helped was I did a program with the heart, as you, you know, did with trauma was did this Harvard program in refugee trauma. Right where I, um, you know, talked about trauma, talked about what happened with refugees and others. Um, the piece about writing from others, I just think is, it, is um, it was very, it was, I had to do sort of a deep dive into myself yeah. and intentions were not enough, like you could have the best intention of the world and still get it wrong. So I, I had to sort of figure out, well, why was I doing it? And, um, and then again, I was getting it wrong all the time. And it wasn't until um, I w had this deeper commitment and deeper involvement with this community in Burlington that I felt comfortable. There was, there was a point when I just thought, you know, stay in my lane, don't do it. You know, don't publish this book. Right. Um, and that's when, and it was right around the time of American Dirt and all that was right. happening. And, um, and I was talking to Abdi Rashid Hussein, who was one of the men I was working with in, in Burlington. And he said, so you're not going to tell our story now because this is happening over here. And, and so at that point, I felt it was no longer my story, uh, I, or at least it wasn't just about me. You know, it was like this other thing. And that kind of gave me, I think it was, I think it was the movement from, from being, uh, I mean, being a contemplative to an activist in like novelists are famous for being or at least American novelists, we think of like as alone in a room, making their, creating their Moby Dick. You know? yeah. And um, I had to get out of the room and I had to engage with this community in order to write Sarah, in order to figure out who she was and why she was. And it was that movement, I think, that gave me the confidence and gave her the character eventually that I got right, which, because I was getting it wrong all along. So, that movement that happened in the course of the book, and it's the movement that Father Christopher take, undertakes from being solely a contemplative, alone in his cell, in his enclosure, to actually having to step up and um, do something, be an right. activist, and, and, and um, you know, hide, harbor this woman. In a sense, in a, in a small, very small sense, it's the, 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 the journey that I took in the course of this book. Right. So, and, it, and I think it's a journey that a lot of people in this country maybe, or artists have come to realize that, that the need for that, the need for engagement, that, you know, the great white man writing his, his, his book, it's like, that's a, that's a model of the past. Yeah. And you talk about that in the essay. Yeah. Um, that you recently yeah, to, wrote. Yeah, there's an essay in Lit Hub today about white men land and literature, and it's about, um, it's about, some, yeah, one, you have it at the end of your notes. I have it, I have it in <laughs> my notes. So, um, yeah, it's just about the history of, of novel making in America and how, how it has its roots in this. Yeah, but you know, the one of the things that I found really fascinating about the, the essay, because you're talking about um, the process of writing being inviting other people in is what Father Christopher does is like he's very fearful um, to a certain extent of the world you know he's lived this very cloistered life and he's 
the forced at some moment to decide whether he is going to let someone else in or whether he's going to continue to live that very closed off life. And he makes that very bold decision. And you talk about the novel, the American novel being um, a, a space in which the occupier um, continues to perpetuate the occupation. Yeah, yeah. Which, and I was wondering whether you could uh, elaborate because I thought it was, it, it, I thought it was fascinating. Yeah. Well, to me, the space within a book yes. and the space on the land, I mean, that they're, I, I always feel that they're connected somehow, that, that both are a form of occupation on, on, I mean, at least in this country that, um, I mean, in, in a good sense, in terms of like, um, in the sense of that, I always feel, I mean, we have a, we live in a, on a farm and we raise our own vegetables and we have goats. Um, and that, you know, making art on that sort of blank slate of land is, is a lot like making art on, on this plane. So, so, um, so text and landscape, in my mind, is always part of the same, part and parcel of the same thing. And so um, the history in the United States, at least, is that there was no blank slate, there were people living here. So, um, and that they were exterminated or pushed off and there was a presence that was there and it was made clean for occupation. Um, and the other presence was, you know, the African presence that was here since 1619, at least, you know, so, and, you know, Toni Morrison makes this argument in, in Playing in the Dark was like that we, that every white American writer that came after, uh, you know, preceded, uh, and he came after that presence. And, the, and her argument is that they were influenced, that every writer was influenced by that presence. Um, she doesn't talk about as much about the indigenous presence, but she talks about the African right. presence. So, um, so how do we, how do I, you know, as a white novelist, enter that tradition and not reinscribe that right. same story? And so, um, which I have. I mean, I wrote a, I wrote a goat, you know, goat song is all about enclosing in a, a place and keeping goats and living off the land and living happily ever after. It's a pastoral. You know, and I wrote it 12 years ago. And then since then, I've thought, well, this is weird. Who, who, are you, who are you fencing in and out? And so there's this palpable sense in rural America that, I mean, even in, in Vermont, you know, that you are still a gated community. Right. It's, it's interesting because in the essay, you talk about the fact that the mid-century um, American, white American writers really continued the, their path of erasure in their literature because they didn't want to deal with the discomfort of the actions that were taken by their predecessors. And you talk about, you know, being, being hesitant about inviting people in, but there's something beautiful about mm -hmm. what you've done is you've created a Vermont community that is inclusive. Yeah. And on the, on the page is saying, you know, I live in a Vermont that now isn't just all white, even though it's very white. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I mean that's, <laughs> well, so here's the, con here's the contradiction. You know? It <laughs> is, so yes, we have Bernie Sanders, yeah, we're great. We have, we have, we could, we could pride ourselves on our progressiveness, but, you know, as I say in this essay, it's like, yes, but we're the whitest state yeah. in the country. So there's this disconnect between sentiment and reality. Um, I mean, my friend Lori Stavron at, U, at the U.S. Committee of Refugees and Immigrants, she's the one who kind of turned this whole book around when it was sinking, you know, when I was like in my panic moment of, I don't know what I'm doing, Sarah is not a real character. She's the one who said, do you want to make Sarah a real character? And I said, yes, please help. And that she's the one who was instrumental in sort of opening the doors to this Somali community because she was trusted and she had been working for these, you know, for this community for a long time. She calls it deep north, the, the, the Yankee yeah. attitude of like, um, you know, I don't see color or, um, you know, that, so the, yeah, the, the book. Um, that phenomenon. So the book is still a, fa it's still a fiction in some ways. I mean, it's, yes, it's inclusive. And yes, there's Teddy Fletcher, who's the Afghan war vet, but would this really happen in the real world? I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's for you guys to. Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, I think it doesn't matter. Well, it's a it model. Not, it's a model. It's a model for how. You know, it's, it, when, when I was working on my play, S -S Sweat, um, I had to immerse myself in, in Reading, 
the community of Reading, Pennsylvania, and you talk about writing across race or writing from another's perspective, is that had characters in that play who were white supremacists. Yeah, exactly. And I was really very terrified to not only write about them, but to actually have to inhabit um, their bodies and find some empathy and compassion yeah. and find the ways to render them in three dim dimensions. And it's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I thought that people are not going to accept these characters. They're not going to accept the fact that I'm writing these characters. But one of the things that I always lean on when I'm writing outside of myself is finding ways to be truthful and authentic and honest. And I think that ultimately that's what the readers or the audiences respond to if something feels like you're being truthful, even if it's painful, yeah. even if it's difficult, or even if it's challenging. Yeah. Um, I know it's time for questions, oh, so but I, I just want to uh, I just want to make one yes. comment on what you just said, which um, to answer a question you asked a while ago about how do you do it. Uh, I mean, you know why, but how? And I think there's a thing I came across um, when I was doing this Harvard program in refugee trauma. Um, and it's, it's not, so how do you inhabit others? It's not just empathy, yeah. right? It's not intention. And it's not just putting yourself in someone's shoes because that's kind of a violent act. Like I'm going to occupy your <laughs> shoes. Like I'm going to fill myself in your shoes and then represent you. So it's this guy, David Augsburger, who was a, a, um, a Mennonite theologian. I think he's still around who has this term interpathy, which I just came across. And it's in it. And, and the definition of it is the cognitive imagining the, of the thoughts and feelings of someone who's a truly other from you. And that when I read that, like the lights went off, it's like, oh, that's what novelists do. I mean, that's at the best is what they do. It's like you empty yourself out and you try to just, you know, have right. yeah. it's not you, it's them. So with the white supremacists, you did it. <laughs> And so I, I see it's now time to ask questions. And if, are there any questions out there? Yeah, and if you have a question, feel free to go meet Nyla um, in the front of the room with the microphone. I think you have to come up. Oh, yeah. No, but, but for but Zoom, for, they, for they the need you for Zoom. For at, at yeah. home. For all you out there in the Zoom audience. Zoom audience will be very grateful. Thank you for being willing to stand. Hey, Brett. A um, couple of times you mentioned when you were writing the Somalian character, it didn't feel right or it felt untrue. I, I guess I'm just curious why you thought that or, and then maybe, was there a point that you got over that and you kind of, you know, maybe a little bit about that? Sure. Um, did everybody hear that? So, um, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't get over it. I, I actually, <laughs> changed it because what what I was doing is I had this idea of who she was that was sort of my fantasy and um, and it, it was not until I as I said sort of engaged and more fully with this community um, I mean one strange thing that I had left out completely was her faith yeah. like and that of course that would be the first thing that any Muslim, would you know or any somali man or woman would have at their disposal and would have as one of their tools in their kit for survival i mean that's how sarah survives is that she has this routine she has this belief she has this faith without that she'd have nothing so i had not included that <laughs> and so it was like one of those moments when you're just like what was i think so things like that you know there were other things but that, that's the most obvious Anyone else? What other questions? Um, we have a question from the Zoom um, from Betsy Lerner, which is, do you think this novel could be adapted into a play? That's really <laughs> I think aspects of, of, of the novel certainly could be adapted for the stage, but it is expansive. Um, and part of the beauty of it is that it invites you to go to many different places. And I think that that would be slightly more challenging, though I do think it would make a beautiful film. Yeah, I mean, we, we had talked beforehand about like having a discussion about the difference between 
novel writing and playwriting and that's like for some other occasion some other, yes. that we'd love to do because the, there are two forms of storytelling and one happens you know here in in a box and the other one happens in this other kind of box and um and one involves community and the other involves this privacy you know between you and 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 and, and there's lots of benefits and, and drawbacks to, to both yeah it's yeah uh, uh, cool. Are there other questions? I have one quick question if I can sneak it in, which um, I was, uh, this just made me think about it is, is the environment and land is one of the central characters in the, in the book. And you mentioned that you are a goat farmer and that you have this intimacy with nature and all of the characters in some way are cultivators, mm -hmm. you know, the, at, at some point yeah. in their life. Yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could just talk about why the land is so central to the storytelling. I mean, it's very, and when you're reading the book, you know, you have this visceral reaction to yeah. the way in which you describe, you know, the, the mist and... Yeah. Um, I just, it's, it's sense of place to me is just, um, I mean, I, I read in that essay, you know, we, we begin with the land, yeah. Joy Harjo, you know, it's, and it does seem, um, I mean, I have a very visceral sense that, literary art or any art comes from the land. I mean, it's all an outgrowth of the soil one way or another. And I mean, storytelling itself is, is you know, written in the landscape. I mean, you know, from Aboriginal Australian with their song lines and indigenous people. So it's really, um, I, I can't get away from it. <laughs> you know, it's just something I can't get away from. So I don't it's know. It's rendered beautifully. Other questions? Um, we have a couple more on Zoom, but if you want to ask a question, if anyone else wants to uh, form a line over there. Spencer. Hey. Hi, Spencer. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> uh, what do you work, well, who's taking care of the goats? Oh, our good friend Caroline, who takes care of the dogs and the goats and the cats. This was lovely. And thank you for uh, all the questions. Uh, what, what are you working on? Are you, are you, have you started something new now? Yeah. Are you, can, you, <laughs> can you say a little bit about it? I, well, it's nonfiction, I'll, I'll say. <laughs> it's, 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 it's nonfiction and um, it's complicated. <laughs> so I, I think that I'm gonna, okay. So it's, it's, it's a- <laughs> Come on. The wife says, come on. So I, <laughs> Um, it's a book, it's something that I've been working on for my whole life, which is a book about, about depression and, and grief and seasonality and mythology and how all those things, finding a new way to talk about depression that's not chemical, or, <laughs> that's, not depre that's not depressing. Thank you, Marie Lorenz. Um, that's not depressing, you know, because there's, I think, as um, I'm going to forget her name. Is it Julia Chris Davis? Uh, or no, it's Simone, Bill, Simone, not Beauvoir, the other Simone Vile. You know, it's like I, I owe my, I'm going to ma mess up the quote, but Don't basically worry, her owning everything that moves her to her melancholy, to her depression. So depression as kind of a teacher or as a journey. I haven't written it yet, but I've written pages and pages and pages my whole life about it. So it's, it's a book somehow, but it's nonfiction. You miss me? What's that? You miss me? You know what? You miss me? Oh, I miss you, yes, yeah. but you're here. That's so. my last question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't miss you now. Do you miss me? <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a follow-up, hard to follow up on that, but your writing is so grounded in fact. Your, your fiction is, and I know you do deep research. Could you describe your process of launching from nonfiction and factual research and making the bridge to fiction? Here we, here we are in the a room with a fiction. Yeah. And that seems to be a very tricky, but important empathetic leap? Yeah, um, good question. And it's something that we talked about because we both share this. I mean, you know, we first met 
in the 80s. Uh, and Lynn was working for Amnesty International. Yeah, I was working for Amnesty International. And so it, it, as, a, as a press officer, yeah. you know, so, and I was working at The Nation. So both of us were involved in journalism and advocacy in some form. And, um, and then both of us ended up writing stories, storytelling. And um, so I have that, that's just kind of built into the DNA about like, well, you have to get things right. You have to do the research. You need to get your soil. Like you, you're basically like, doing all this research and getting all this stuff to to create to create a compost that you can then grow your characters out of so it's this constant sort of mulching and gathering Do you, is that yeah, yeah i think that that's true and i also think for me it's like um at amnesty when i made i can i remember the exact moment when i made the leap from being the press officer to wanting to write another play is that a story was told to me which i felt um, there's no way I can convey the complexity of what has been shared in a press release. The only way I can do it is to somehow fictionalize it and put language into the mouths of these characters that can um, tell a truth that would be too complicated for me to render in, yeah. in a page. Exactly, yeah. Um, we have another question from Zoom from Macarena. Um, thank you for this inspiring conversation. I'm wondering if you can say more about North in terms of migration narratives and perhaps other recent literature on migration that may have inspired you or you think about. Um, yeah, what was the first part of that question? I missed. Um, thank you. And um, I'm wondering if you can say more about North in terms of migration narratives and perhaps oh, migration recent narratives, yeah. Um, well, this I'll answer the second part, which is, um, Mohsin Hamid's uh, Exit West, I think he does an, an, he did an amazing job of um, fictionalizing, you know, what was happening in Syria and then making this kind of magical realist tunnel that he had, that his characters go through to, to come to a different place, which was kind of genius because that all the nitty gritty he could just leave out. <laughs> and so, but I was kind of determined to show what it's actually like step stage by stage. Um, you know, no judgment here. I actually think is, is, I mean, that's a great book. And the other one was, I guess, Yuri, Yuri Herrera, um, Science Proceeding, End of the, the World. That was another migration narrative that I think from Mexico, he's a Mexican writer. Yes. Good evening. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if there's a story behind this cover. That's very captivating. Um, well, you see, Lynn is modeling the cover right now. This is this is her boo boo. <laughs> yeah, this is my yes, my scarf. I wore it. Um, so. I this is like the color to me. I mean, um, you know, Tracy, my editors here, Michael, the publishers here, and they 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 did an amazing job. Um, it was all about the color of blue, and which there's a certain color in Vermont in winter, where you have this. Um, I can't even put it into words. Um, and so, you know, the monastery is called Blue Mountain Monastery. And um, this sense of blueness, I mean, you could go in any direction with that. We could talk, you know, the blues, we could go, we could go on. <laughs> but um, they, I had sent some paintings that, that really, I thought got the spirit of the book, which was a color and it was, and they ran with it. I mean, the um, the designer and the illustrator, whose name these guys can tell you, like just did this kind of brilliant snow stars. Because there's a lot of astrology in the book. I mean, Sarah navigates by the stars. She knows all these stories about Somali lore is a big thing um, about the stars. So I, I love it. I love what they did. Thank you. Um, and our final question is, how did writing North change your own relationship to religion or spirituality? Um, I, I, think, I think it just showed me the continuities in the religions. I mean, I, I point this out in the book a lot, that I'm, that the stories, the biblical stories of 
of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran form a, form a kind of trilogy and that they're related. And if you're a Muslim, you know, you know the Christian stories, you know the Jewish prophets. They believe it, you know, Muslims, they're part of their, their prophets too. So in the book, you know, Father Christopher um, doesn't know Sarah's story. She doesn't know the Muslim prophets. She doesn't know, and he has, he's kind of forced to kind of learn, meet her halfway where she knows about Mary, she knows about Jesus, she knows all those stories. So it just made me, it, it confirmed what I sort of suspected or already knew is that, that they're all a form of storytelling and, um, and storytelling is, is a tool that humans have that, that keep us alive. Um, and, and, you know, that keep us, like faith is part of that. All right, let's give them a big hand.